coordinator, and I will be your host for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining our Tech Landscape Latin America 2024, a deep dive into Latin American tech talent webinar. What are we going to be covering today? Well, we have five topics. One, tech talent in Latin America, a main overview. Two, what to look for when seeking Latin American talent. Three, main countries overview. Four, overall comparison. And five, in 2024, what to expect. Of course, we will be answering your questions toward the end of the webinar. So without further ado, let me introduce you our amazing panelists. We have Vanessa Romero. She is the head of talent acquisition. She's got ample experience in talent acquisition. She has been in the industry for over 10 years now. Vanessa is a skill psychologist specializing in talent recruitment for software outsourcing and IT services. She refines company strategy for staff allocation, continuously enhancing screening criteria. We also have Luisa Romero, who has been in the industry for over three years now. Luisa is actively involved in sourcing, recruitment, and allocation processes. Now, Luisa is also a psychologist specializing in recruitment and talent acquisition. She excels in aligning client needs with ideal candidates. She guides her team to successful placements, optimizing the talent acquisition process and innovative strategies. So without further ado, please, Vanessa and Luisa, take it away. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so everyone, it's, it's it's really nice to be talking today about tech uh, talent and landscape in Latin America. So first of all, um, why are we talking about this? Uh, I wanted to, first of all, help you understand why Latin America has been trending so much whenever we talk about outsourcing and nearshoring uh, tech talent. First of all, as you can see in the in the graph over here, Latin America is the top region nowadays in terms of new hire, uh, new hires overall. And this is due to um, the e great increase in startups that nowadays are now worth than um, worth more than one billion dollars and these are called unicorns so because of the increase on these unicorns of course we are um producing more developers getting more talent uh, getting the talent pool bigger and of course investing a lot in all of different programs that uh, are related to of course work on those unicorns as well so all of these latin american governments uh initiatives educational programs uh, such as universities having uh, free programs for um, programs re related to technology uh, have done that the region uh, becomes a leader in IT and software services overall. So if we go to the to the next slide, I wanted to show you a bit of how is the talent pool looking in Latin America. So nowadays, Latin America has over 1.2 million developers and this is projected to grow up to 2.5 million by 2025 by next year we have a couple of the main countries here uh, from latin america i wanted to highlight brazil because brazil is actually the, the biggest uh, country and the biggest in the talent pool as well uh, we have over 750,000 it professionals in brazil only and this increases every year because, as I mentioned before, all of the programs that are related to education and preparing more and more people to work in IT has grown. So the uh, information and communication technology graduates annually grows over uh, 45,000 um, new graduates in IT. Um, related roles. Uh, after Brazil, we have countries like Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, and many, many others that um, we're going to be uh, getting into later with Vanessa. Um, so this is increased by, of course, uh, the interest and the popularity of nearshore uh, companies. So if I am a new developer in the market, I am interested in working for any company that provides me with career aspirations related to IT. Um, and, and of course, work with different um, clients outside my country as well. Um, as you can imagine, this has a huge impact, not only on um, 
not only on the technical uh, knowledge of the population and the technical knowledge of uh, the already professionals that we have, but also it has some interesting outcomes that we can see in the next uh, slide, and those are the economic ones. I wanted to mention this because sometimes we don't uh, think about the impact that something has until you know we, we check the numbers and we, we wonder, hey, like, what has been different since the moment that the nearshoring companies appeared in Latin America and how has this impacted? Um, so one of the most positive outcomes is, of course, job, job creation, the foreign investment, and actually the Inter-American Development Bank, the, the IDB, estimates that nearshoring could add up to $78 billion to the Latin American exports every year which is, is huge, as I said, on job creation, foreign investment. And one of the main things is tech transfer. So the knowledge transfer and the fact that um, whenever we work for um, a different company, a company outside um, Latin America, that brings us a lot of knowledge to invest on. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in a second. Um, also, if I am a developer, why would I be also interested in working for a nearshoring company? Uh, reports suggest that uh, software engineers in developing countries make 28% more than, uh, you know, 28% more in an international organization rather than a, a local one. So, of course, besides all the technological advantages, all the growth opportunities, of course, I, I would be also be having access to a better salary probably. Um, now, if we go to, um, now that we know, we know what Latin America has to offer, we know what, what um, why is it so important nowadays, what can you find when you are looking for talent in Latin America? So um, just to have a little bit of data of past years in 2022, the top five, um, the top five roles that were outsourced overall were in the first place IT, so software engineers and developers. Then we had design, product, quality assurance, project, man project management. And then in 2023, still the first place was uh, to IT, software engineers and developers. It, it, it is definitely not a surprise. But then we have also different roles related to BPO um, uh, strategies such as sales, content, and then product and design as well. So IT is the most popular thing to nearshore, and it is because, of course, it works. Um, we add, uh, or the intention in this in this space that we have with you is, of course, to talk about the popular technologies and what to find. What what can I be sure that I would be uh, successfully hiring whenever I'm in, in in searching in Latin America? I wanted to, you know, we're going to get to specifics in a second with Vanessa, but we also need to talk about the emerging areas. And one of the emerging areas that I wanted to, to mention or just like give us an example is Internet of Things. We learned empirically, uh, very, very out of experience here in Job City, that of course IoT was developed um, in the US probably way better, uh, way earlier than in Latin America. But the thing that Latin America has to offer here is how much growth uh, has in the latest years. Um, the growth that we have is super, super fast. And uh, just as, to give you kind of like a reference here is that in 2021, the number of IoT connections, like every IoT connection, uh, totaled uh, uh, 798 million. And by next year, we, uh, we are... Um, we're going to increase up to 1.2 billion IoT connections. So it is something that it took us time to get, but whenever we got into it, we definitely took advantage of it. And there is so much research about it nowadays, um, and it's rapidly uh, increasing the, the knowledge overall. So how can we this? How can we sum up everything that I have just mentioned about the talent market uh, here? Um, I believe the best, best way to sum it up is by you're going to find generalist professionals. And this has a lot of, um, a lot of explanations. Um, of course, we know it because with such popularity of nearshoring companies, we, because we have gained confidence on the talent pool that has career aspirations, as I said. Um, we have encountered that his, this has a historical context, definitely. So... Um, you already know what a unicorn is, 
and uh, it, this startup, this culture of startup has made the Latin American professionals to be resourceful, to be, you need to learn a new technology that you never uh, worked with before, you're going to learn it and you're going to, you know, put it to the test and you're going to be able to change within technologies and say, hey, like I, for this type of project, I believe that um, I can learn this new technology because that has this, um, features that this one doesn't have so historical context the market dynamics uh a startup or like the the prevalence of startups in latin america has made the the it professionals here um in in a way that they can mash up their skills and make um make their growth significantly better so you're gonna find journalist professionals for your advantage and i believe that that's a wonderful thing to have whenever you're hiring someone uh different with a different culture it is so exciting for them um to get the opportunity to learn so many things from other parts of the world uh, now we should get to the specifics now that we got the general overview so vanessa uh can tell us a bit more about that Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Luisa, for all that information. Um, so yeah, before we go deep into or deeper into um, the countries that we selected to give you an insight about, I wanted to show you a little bit of why they have been selected, right? Um, so obviously, as Luisa said, we have uh, four dominating countries in Latin America that um, have been investing and have been growing in terms of um, software development and specifically in software outsourcing. So we have in the top list, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and Colombia. So we're gonna review those and a couple more as well. Um, so let's get into it. Um, one of the important things that I have to mention is the source of the data. So basically we um, conducted a research internally and with the databases that we have access to, which is obviously LinkedIn's workforce information, um, so most of the things that we're going to be talking about are, um, about candidates that we have access to. Um, and of course the exclusivity of the information because nobody else has, um, this type of information. So let's go a little bit into the country countries that we're going to be reviewing and the most common technologies by country. So we have for Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Dominican Republic, a dominance in JavaScript. So that is extremely important to notice because JavaScript has been growing in the area a lot. And that comes also with the frameworks, the most typical frameworks. Uh, so we can find, you know, React developers, Node developers, Angular developers, Developers and th the things that are in the mix as well, something a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, we also have a Java prominence, Python prominence, C sharp prominence, and then for a few countries, PHP. And uh, one important thing to notice or to mention is that really um, it's not that the other countries or the other technologies um, do not work with <laughs> um, a Latin American candidates, but um, it's just the prevalence, right? Um, so it's just what is dominant. But of course, we can find um, talent of other technologies. And you're going to be able to see that in a bit also when you when you are able to see kind of what Job City makes better, right? Um, so let's go uh, rapidly. So in no particular order, <laughs> we're just uh, starting with Mexico and Peru. So Mexico has the highest proportion of developers per working person with zero. 0.42 developers per working person, which is impressive, actually, is the second largest in Latin America in terms of population of developers, right? Um, around 50% of them can communicate, I mean, 50% of the working um, population can communicate in English and 40% when it comes to developers, which is amazing, actually. Like, a lot of the developers are looking and interested and in speaking in English. Um, one important thing is that Mexico has the highest proportion of female devs in the continent, still very low, 17%. Um, but it's interesting because many of us are, you know, looking to meet, um, DEI, um, quotas. And actually when looking for female developers, Mexico would be a good place to go. Something important about Mexico, uh, there's a tech hub, a dominating tech hub in Mexico City. Some of our com uh, companies, uh, we've been trying, you know, to expand our limits and, you know, create some other tech hubs in other places of Mexico. But the reality is that it's a bigger concentration 
of um, technology professionals in Mexico City. Now let's go to Peru. Peru compared to Mexico has the fewest deaths per working person with 0.22. Um, they have a trend to use PHP as a main programming language, which is interesting, right? Um, and 29% of the deaf community can communicate in English. Again, very um, contrasting um, with the 40% that we find in Mexico. And um, the biggest employers of the deaf community are consultancy companies. So it's interesting how you can find a lot of technical professionals that have been working also more like offshoring and more like consultancy companies, big consultancy com companies, they found, you know, their hub in Peru. So moving forward to Brazil, um, again, highest population of devs in the companies, no surprise, also the biggest company of the, uh, the I'm sorry, the biggest country of the region. Um, there are important and significant tech hubs in cities like Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro, but it's important to mention that there are some other, you know, emerging tech hubs that do not have the same demand. So it's easier to find talent in regions like Porto Alegre or Recife. Um, I guess the weakest point about Brazil is that um, the English level is not so good. Um, and we can find this pattern in other countries as well, regardless, just because of the fact that there are so many developers, still is a great pool of candidates. Um, around 50% of the development workforce can communicate in English, which is actually good. But again, the bottom three in general, overall English speaking countries. And the bigger employers in, in this um, particular region are local unicorns, kind of what Luisa was talking about, companies like iFood, Newbank, Rappi, you know, these companies that started, you know, to create a big tech hub environment in the different cities in Brazil. Now, let's talk about Colombia. Um, one of the most interesting facts about Colombia is that there is a good proportion of developers that do not attend university. Um, they actually get, um, you know, their certifications from courses that are, um, basically promoted by the government. So not everyone in Colombia has the opportunity to go to the university because it's paid education, but a lot of people are attending to this government courses and uh, a, good, a good amount of developers come from these institutions. Um, so kudos to Colombia, you know, so for, for providing um, the ability to get education in technology, regardless of the possibility to access higher education. Then weak point again for Colombia in this case would be um, the English is the second worst English level for the continent with only 10% of the sample being able to communicate in English. Um, that has been a struggle for companies that are dedicated to export talent to the US because uh, most of the times uh, we have to struggle evaluating the English level. However, I do want to mention that in cities like Bogota or Medellin, there are tech hubs growing um, and there are a lot of expats moving to these countries and uh, promoting the English as a second language. So I think this is going to change um, in the short term, especially because of the influence. But for now, we still, we still have a weak point there. Um, and in terms of nearshoring and IT, com IT consultancy companies, they are great employees. As I mentioned before, um, given um, the, the, the growth of cities like Medellin and, and Bogota in terms of tech hubs, um, I mean, in these cities, you, you can find a lot of nearshoring companies and actually Job City being one of them. Um, so yeah, now let's go to some other countries. <laughs> um, let's go to Ecuador. Um, we couldn't, um, you know, have this opportunity and not talk about Ecuador since Ecuador is our home um, here at Job City. So um, when we're talking about deaf community, uh, we have this particularity that contrasts with, uh, for example, Colombia, because 78% of the deaf community obtain a higher education degree. So we have not as small, you know, not as big, I'm sorry, um, deaf community, but very well educated. Um, since compared to other countries, you know, um, like the big ones, typically people do not think about Ecuador at first. And that makes that the, the talent is not as demanded as it is in countries like Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico. Um, 
and the whole country in general is a gem because you, when you're able to find good talent, um, you, you get to get a name and, and get to have very good professionals. Um, since it's our home, Job City is a top employer in the country. Um, and this is another country alongside Peru that has the highest prevalence um, of PHP developers. This is, this is actually the highest. Um, again, weakest point would be the English level of the workforce. In general, it tends to be low. Now, talking about Dominican Republic, um, we decided to talk about it because it's one of our top five countries where we have employees in, which is remarkable. Um, considering that it's not a huge country and the deaf community is not as big. But what do we have here that is um, remarkable? The English level. So the developers that you can find that can communicate and adapt to the American culture is bigger. Um, and that makes uh, Dominican Republic and in general Caribbean islands um, a good place to go to when finding people that can adjust to the American culture easily. Um... Weak point, <laughs> um, they have the fewest female devs of the sample with only 11%. We would say it's not that different from the 17%, but actually 1% makes a big difference when it comes to, you know, um, having representation. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically um, a little bit what we can say about Dominican Republic. And finally, we have Argentina. Again, no special <laughs> order, um, just talking about the different countries. So Argentina proportionally has the large development, uh, has a large development community, only surpassed, surpassed by Mexico. Um, so it's, it's important. Um, one of the important things also to mention is that um, two of the biggest companies um, that are dedicated to nearshoring were born in Argentina. So part of the unicorns that you can find in the nearshoring world are from Argentina. And that has shaped the way um, the city has developed and the whole country has developed. So Buenos Aires is a well-established tech hub and uh, whomever you talk to from the tech community are well aware and well knowledgeable about what it is nearshoring, how do you work with international companies? And it has become in a way um, a career aspiration. Um, and that's why most of the developers in Argentina tend to speak English because they are super aware of how you can, you know, work for other companies um, for, from the U.S. or from other countries. So, yeah. And another fun fact or important fact is that they have a strong preference for Java with 33% of the dev development sample having this particular skill. So those were facts um, about countries. Let's take a quick review in terms of the English proficiency because that kind of makes a big difference between, between all the countries and technologies. Um, so when we're looking for a certain developer, where can you find the, the most well-spoken developers? Python developers. They tend to be the best um, English speakers among the whole sample and throughout the different countries. Um, so yeah, Python developers tend to be better, followed by JavaScript developers, Java developers come third, and finally PHP. And it's no coincidence that PHP is a leading development um, language in those countries where the English level is not so good, like Peru or Ecuador. Now, um, regarding uh, the percentage of English speakers in the dev community per country, we have a leading Argentina, then we have Brazil, that even though the English level is not so good, the country is so big that still the talent pool is huge for, for um, companies like Job City or others can source from, right? Um, then in third place, we have Dominican Republic again. And it's awesome to see the, the, the comparison because Dominican Republic is so small compared to, to Brazil that actually from the dev community, you can find very well-spoken developers. Um, and uh, then we have Mexico, followed by Colombia, Ecuador, and finally Peru. Then about Job City, are we limited only to JavaScript? Are we limited only to Python? Are we limited only to PHP? Not really. As I mentioned before, we can find um, talent from other technologies and actually in Job City, from either of these uh, five technologies that you can see here, 
you can expect to receive very good candidates from the first batch of candidates. Uh, let's say for the first four, you could find, you know, the developer that you were looking for, and you can expect someone to be sitting with you um, within less than 40 days, and you can expect to receive them in less than four days. So it's actually amazing to see how we can, you know, find talent in Latin America. So moving forward, what to expect in 2024? And this is just to summarize everything, right? So obviously OOP programming languages will keep on dominating mm, the talent landscape. It doesn't mean that functional development um, <clears throat> has no representation, but definitely there is a big prevalence as it is in many other places in the world. Um, and Java, Java, Java and JavaScript on top. <laughs> Candidates will be mainly sourced from Brazil and Argentina because of the likelihood of finding more candidates, suited candidates and engaged candidates, which is, which is also very important. Um, the talent pool will increase, as Luisa mentioned, as government initiatives are, and big outsourcing companies continue expanding and gaining more attention in each country. Um, the remote and international work will be preferred over on-site local work for English-speaking developers, especially English-speaking developers. So right now, it's very unlikely to find English-speaking developers working for a local company. Most of the developers that you can find out there in Latin America are already well aware of the nearshoring system and how to you know, get involved in the nearshoring system. And finally, and this is something that is very particular, and not so long ago I was reading a report about this, you can expect to receive more diverse developers in terms of backgrounds. Because again, since becoming a developer working for um, international companies has become kind of a dream, kind of a, kind of a, a career aspiration, you can find um, what is called unorthodox candidates or unorthodox developers, people that have already a higher education degree in, um, let's say, philosophy, I know one, <laughs> psychology, I also know one, <laughs> um, a dentist, also know one. So it's very common to have people that come from very different backgrounds, but find a spot um, in, the, in the development community just because how big the industry is in the, in the region. So those are the things that you can definitely expect. Um, so I think this is pretty much it. So thank you very much. And Tati, I think we have to go to the questions. <laughs> yes, we have received a couple of questions in our chat. So I will read them. Uh, so Jason Parker asks, how can U.S. companies effectively engage with the generalist approach of Latin American tech professionals to maximize their contributions to various technology projects? Great. Uh, I can take that, definitely. Uh, that's a really great question and, and something that we foster a lot here in Job City. I mean, the, the HR team and the client success team are always trying to, you know, try to get familiar, uh, get the client familiar with the type of culture their, um, their employees are in. And I would say the main one is, First of all, if you understand the generalist approach, you're halfway there. Uh, simply understand that they're going to have a broader set of skills uh, that they can know a little bit about something and a little bit about something else. That is a great advantage. And then I would say that, of course, foster the communication and the cultural understanding of that and giving the chance and the opportunities for someone to um, you know, try to work on something that they have not so much experience uh, in, and I'm sure that the potential will, will come with time only. So creating the spaces and understanding gener the generalist approach, I would say, are the, the two main things. Thank you. Um, we have Sam Moore, and his question is, what trends are you seeing in Drupal and React? Hmm. Interesting question. Well, Drupal was a very widespread um, CMS in Latin America um, a few years back. I would say between five to 10 years back, it was well spread and you could find a lot of PHP developers with expertise in Drupal. But, and to be honest, um, developers have migrated to more, let's say popular, like React, <laughs> 
um, technologies. So finding the Drupal developer is not as easy as it was a couple of years ago. Um, so that's kind of the trend. The trend has been that people going or migrating to more demanded or popular technologies rather than, than Drupal. You could still find them, especially in those countries where PHP remains as, a, as an important programming language, but not as easy as it was a couple of years back. Um, in terms of React, you can expect to keep growing. Uh, it's impressive how, like, the amount of people that want to work with React and that have been gaining, you know, expertise in the matter. So, yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question from Jacob. It seems like U.S. natives are starting to have trouble finding jobs when graduating from school or boot camps. Do you expect that Latin American developers will face similar challenges when so many new developers are entering the market? Mm -hmm. that, that is something that is, of course, always a, a concern in, in any type of, of degree. But I would say one thing about Latin American market is actually they're really open to junior developers. And that's one of the things that we actually did foster, foster a lot with programs of, of like next gen programs and things like that, where um, there is so much potential, as we have seen there, there is so much potential that local companies, uh, first of all, because of course, they're trying to send a little bit of save a little bit of money. But they give the chance to these junior developers and usually, you know, software engineering type of degrees, uh, they're really safe over here when, when finding a job. Um, as I said, the, the boom of the unicorns and the boom of the technology itself, it, it gives a huge market. And the only the only most important thing to have is the space, you know, having the a possibility from a company to say, yes, I am open for a, a junior with a lot of potential or, or someone or maybe hiring someone that can foster or having a culture of um, share new knowledge and share new things and training and all of this it's very important and that that's uh, um, that's something that can definitely you know change the market and change the talent pool and that, that's why sometimes as I said the career aspiration aspirations are actually going to a near sharing company because they already learn so much from local companies here okay thank you um, we have another question uh, and it says, in what ways can U.S. companies strategically leverage the emerging areas of expertise, such as the Internet of Things within the Latin American tech talent pool? Great question as well. I was uh, wondering that myself uh, not so long ago when we were looking for uh, IoT professionals. So uh, one of the main important things is to, of course, uh, you have to work with someone that knows the market. And, and we found that, for example, companies like Mexico, like Brazil, like Argentina, like Colombia, they are the ones more developed in uh, technologies like IoT. But I think the most important thing or the most important point is the, uh, the knowledge transfer uh, that I mentioned before in the, during the presentation. And is uh, if you if there is a technology or there is a topic that uh, it is more developed somewhere else, if you give the chance for for someone that is not from there that can have a lot of potential to learn. Uh, if you give them the chance to, you know, get the feeling of how that is, that person is going to bring it here, bring it to the eyes of and, and ears of many people. And that's where it becomes uh, an important, such an important thing here. That's how research started. Uh, probably someone uh, had to look for it and had to look for resources um, outside their country and then brought it here. And, and we got to develop how, how we're used to do it. Okay, we have another question once again from Jason Parker. What concrete steps can U.S. companies take to encourage cross-cultural collaboration and clear communication among project teams that include both U.S.-based and Latin American tech professionals? Okay, uh, well, uh, really hard to say it's step by step, but definitely being aware um, of, of, you know, the, the tech talent landscape and being here is just a very good first step, just to getting to know uh, what you can expect to find, um, you know, in, in this type of, 
of, of countries and given this type of model. I would say that it's important always to have the opportunities to share spaces between the different um, the different communities inside your own company. So have the opportunity for them to exchange ideas, opinions, and find common grounds as well, because we do have a lot of similarities as well. And uh, we have to set that common ground within the company um, just to make sure that we would have, I guess, a smooth um, joint <laughs> between um, between Latin American candidates and U.S. candidates or employees in this case. Um, so yeah, finding common grounds, um, opening up, you know, the communication spaces um, between the different the different teams and the different um, yeah the different communities, and um, and having the opportunity, you know, for them to to also work together towards a, a final goal. There's nothing more team bonding than getting something together. So I think those are things that um, any U.S. employer can foster. And if it's within your possibilities, also have the, the opportunity to meet in person. There's nothing that um, can help more to have something or to have a team that is well uh, rounded in terms of the communication and everything than having the opportunity to meet outside, you know, working environments. So, yeah. OK, and we have one final question. Well, but before that, uh, Peter Walker says, great information. Thanks, Vanessa and Luisa. Now we have a question from Lisa. Um, it's She asks, can I see that slide again that showed the average number of days to fill an opening? Yes, um, the time to fill, it's around a month. Okay, uh, let's go with the, the final one. But uh, the time to fill is uh, around a month from the moment that we receive a position until the person actually gets to start. So that means that usually the evaluation processes go around two weeks and two more weeks for the person to actually start. Of course, this is sample taken from the positions that we got to close. Um, so yeah, this is, um, yeah, the information. I'm not really sure about that. <laughs> Okay, um, and John Holland asks, if I want to hire someone from Latin America, what should I do? Okay, uh, first thing, get a partner. Uh, so get a company like Job City that can help you with the whole process of understanding, you know, everything, um, how it works. And that, I guess, would take the heavy weight off your shoulders. That's one of the things. The second thing is, of course, to know very well exactly what you're looking for. Um, so the company, in this case, Job City, would be able, you know, to source effectively within the different areas, different countries, and different um, communities. And with that, also, finally, um, as we mentioned before, having the opportunity to get this person, I guess seamlessly onboarded into your team. So understanding, you know, the the, the, the particularities of, of a, a Latin American developer. And with that, I think you're set um, to to have a, a Latin America, Latin American employee in your team. Of course, Vanessa. And well, you can always contact Job City. We are here for you. We have the knowledge to do that and to do it just exactly as you need. So um, thank you all so much for, for joining. We don't have, oh, wait, 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 wait. We just got another question from Jason. Mm -hmm. um, when a company selects a candidate to work with, can you describe the behaviors of the company or team, the individual joins that drives some of the strongest work happiness or? Results. Or results. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, right before uh, um, we, we finish, I think there are many variables that can influence the outcome of um, of of the happiness or very good results in, in a developer uh, within a company. But I would say alignment in terms of value and soft skills, making sure that the person that was hired for um, and that was offered um, is exactly what you were looking for, and makes you know a better. Um, fit in terms of what is expected of this person and what can this person provide as well. So I believe that there is nothing better than to feel um, some, someone that is useful 
to a certain project, a certain company and someone that is valued. So I would believe that choosing the right person in terms of what you need and what you expect is the safest guarantee to make sure that the person can um, be happy at the work. Also, one of the most important things, and this is all around development community, is the challenge. So many of the developers currently are looking to have, or yeah, to have it an important challenge in their career. So it's important to always give them something that um, they consider a challenge and something that is some sort of new or some sort of um, uh, that 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 brings them that development. Um, and I think th those are the things that that will help you. So soft skill matching, profile or technical match, and challenging projects with those three um, components. That of course in the soft skills there comes the communication and everything, and you know sharing as the other question um, above. I think that would give uh, a good formula for someone to to be happy and to be. Um, performant in a way. I don't know, Luisa, if you want to add something else to that question. Yes, I, I was I was thinking uh, while you were speaking about challenges, how that answer is so popular whenever you're mapping some like a candidate new from the talent pool that you you ask the question, why are you looking for a change or why are you interested in uh, hearing new opportunities? And, you know, the majority of times that's that's the answer. I I am not feeling um, I don't feel like I have a challenge or something that I, I could be learning or I could be improving. Um, so that's something that we should always keep an eye on and, and definitely set expectations. I think that every company has a, a different work environment or work culture. And it's important to set kind of like, what am I expecting? So the person that is entering to work with me knows what is expected from uh, from him or she. So um, I will, I agree with everything that you just said, and I would just mention that. Perfect. Thank you. Okie dokie. Thank you to the both of you. Um, okay, I'm reviewing the chat and we don't have any other questions. So thank you all so much for joining. Remember that you will receive uh, an email with a link so that you can watch the webinar once again and share it with the people that you uh, consider this webinar would be useful to. Thank you so much for joining. And remember, contact Job City. We have the talent that you require. Thank you so much. Bye bye. And thank you, Luisa and Vanessa. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for the questions. Bye, guys.